evening, everybody. Leslie Adams, Dr. Lambert. Good evening to one and all. You're on the right program right now. Oh, glory to God. sweet the sound save a wretch like me once was lost but now I'm found blind but now I see God be the glory for the great things that he continues to do Good night to Deborah Ross, good night to Sharon Bardswell, good night to Vonda Gospar, the Apostle of Honor. So divine, good night, good night, good night. Antoinette Kane Primo, good night, good night, good night. Baptist is the one who puts the scripture up there for us to read. What a blessing to have her on Facebook Live to team up with us to bring glory, honor, and praise to God. She's the one who lifts her hands up when it comes to finding quickly the scripture that we're talking about. Put them up on the page so people will know that we're not just pulling things off from out of our empty heads. <laughs> glory adios. It's amazing, amazing grace. The sweet song. You will not believe that the man who wrote that song was a drunkard, 
and a slave trader. Drunkard and a slave trader. The original music to this song, he used to hear it in the rum shop. And he put words to it. Amazing Grace. And became one of the biggest hits of all time in terms of gospel. And this man was going to turn his life around and become a great minister of the God. You never know what God can do with a life that is yielded to him. And secondly, you don't give up on people even when they have plucked your last nerve. <laughs> and you just want to say to yourself, it's enough. I can't deal with this anymore. This person has been a liability as long as I've known them. They would not change. They're just a waste of time. Yeah, yeah. Ray, Ray. Tonight, we put the crown on the message with regard to mentorship. Talking about what to do. What to do. When the mentor-protege relationship is threatened. Because Satan hates when greatness teams up. And he can see that the two people shall put 10,000 to flight. And so he introduces a third voice. A third voice. But the problem with the third voice, write this down, is that the third voice wants to be the only voice. The third voice wants to be the only voice. And what the person who has the third voice will do, they are going to disrupt the relationship between the mentor and the mentee for their own selfish ambitions and their own selfish aims. And sometimes very painful experiences happen because you have to let people go. You have to let people that you love, you, you know they have good in them, you can see it. But they also have a mind of their own and you can't overrule their choice. And sometimes they make bad choices. And you've got to let them go. And sometimes you look back with regret, the guilt of letting them go, even though they wanted to be let go. The destruction of a potential giant for God, the destruction of a ministry, a destiny, and all of the people that could have been changed by God had that vessel of honor stuck with the mentor that was leading them and guiding them in the right way. Another thing that disrupts mentor-mentee relationships, so the first one is the third voice. That individual who has come, and they are a separator. I have had many a, an occasion where I introduce people, and the next thing you know, the two people that you introduced two months ago have become so close. Now you're out in the cold for no good reason. Somebody has been saying negative things about you and the individual doesn't have enough discernment to figure out this person is a separator and they dump you. The two people that you introduce, you are no longer friends with either of them. <laughs> it's one of the mysteries of life. They dump you and they get thicker and thicker, thicker and thicker and when they see you, you say hi, nobody answers. They give you a hmm. And what we call the proverbial stink eye. Now you're out in the cold. And it has happened more than once that you introduce people, that I introduce people. And the, the people have become so close. Nothing is wrong with that. But then you are kicked out of both of their lives. And you become a casualty. And to them you're a liability. These are some of the lessons that you learn. The third voice wants to be the only voice. The third voice is the voice of the separator. Is the voice of a demonic plant. What do you mean by demonic plant? When Satan notices that your relationship is going well, he would introduce an Ahithophel. Somebody with a sweet tongue. They are a smooth operator. They will come and disrupt the program. You've had people that come to your church and from the day they come, 
gossip breaks out everywhere because that person is a disruptor. They're a demonic plant that have come to disrupt the program, to scatter the people, to scatter uh, the sheep of the pastor, to cause growth to be stagnated or to scatter the people that you have won. It's a big back door syndrome, I call it. A big front door and a bigger back door. You labor to get them in, and that person, as they come in, they are forcing them out. Every congregation has that one person who is a scatterer. They are not there for any good reason. They are there to drive people out of the congregation by their behavior, by their attitude, by their snide remarks, by their one-upmanship. Sometimes they even pretend to be closer to the pastor than they really are. pastor told me to look out for the interests of this church. And what they are doing is running the person off because they, they are letting them know you are not good for the interests of this church. Big back door syndrome. You have a big front door where people come in sparingly and you have a bigger back door where they go out quickly. And so you're always building while somebody is always breaking. You get them delivered, you get them polished off, you get them on their way, you invest time, skills, money into them, and your investment. Sometimes you have to give up the investment because the more you invest, the more you invest. And good is not coming out of the person. They're getting worse and worse, worse and worse, and they grow this big attitude and they let you know sometimes. They let you know. You can't, um, you're not what I was looking for. I can do it without you. The Lord is showing me. <laughs> These people, the Lord is always showing them. I get so tired with people who the Lord is showing them. The Lord never seems to show them what they need to see to grow. They are led, but they are misled. I said they are led, but they are misled. They are led by a demonic voice in their head. They are led by a carnal believer who is trying to run them out of the place. Because some people, when they see new people come, they feel threatened that their position with something is under threat. And they will do whatever it takes to run that person out. So that their position can be settled. You know, they know that's my spot. This person has a similar gift like I have. And if they are here, instead of people looking to me, they look to us. And I can't afford to divide their attention. I want all that attention to be mine and mine alone. And there are people who are in a choir in, a, in, the, in the music ministry of the church. And if somebody comes in a voice, they will run that person out because they want to be the only voice. They want to sing solo. And if this person comes, they'll have to sing duet. And they'll have to sing quartet and trio and all the rest. They don't want to sing that. They want to be the only star. And they bring you a lot of complaints about that person. This person this, this person that, that person that. But what they really want to do is to cause you to dislike and run off that person. And there's a lot that goes into mentorship that there are some inside tricks that you need to be so aware of. And sometimes you only learn them after a loss. After the loss of the person or family, that's when you begin to see that you were played. You were played like a violin. You were set up. You were set up to concretize a dislike for that person that didn't exist before until this individual started bringing you news on somebody. That's why I tell people now. I say, I say to them, look, look at me here. I like who I like. And I like him. And what that does, it shuts the door to them. They know that when I say that, that means there is nothing you can tell me about that person that's going to make me change my mind. So stop. I like him. That's all she wrote. They look at you very funny, but after knowing you for a while, they know what you mean. And when you say, I like that person, they know, okay, I better not continue because he might see through my plot and scheme and next thing you know, I am the one out in the cold. <laughs> because there are people that will run off 30, 40 people from your business, from your congregation, from your friends list. Run off 40 people. And they themselves haven't brought in one. 
They haven't brought in one. I spoke to a very popular uh, Christian person one time and I said to them, I know that you know tens of thousands of people, but since you've been coming to this church, you have not brought one, but you have run off 26. I'm counting. You have run off 26 people by your attitude, your caustic, acidic, negative tongue. You have run off plenty of people, but you have not brought in one. They look at me for a long time and then they laugh. They laugh because they couldn't... <laughs> they couldn't find an explanation or a reason why I was wrong. And I told them, I said, I've been watching from the time you got here that we lost 26 people. And you're the one that ran them off. And the next person that's going to be run out of here is either you or me. And I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> oh, the things that leaders don't tell you, man. The things they don't tell you because they want to bear the brunt of it and take it on and not disrupt the peace. But sometimes you've got to disrupt the disruptor. Sometimes... You've got to confront the confronter. Sometimes you've got to tell Satan, you got to go. Mm. We serve a God that never comes late. I'm going to begin to pray in a while. He is always on time and he makes things beautiful in his time according to Ecclesiastes 3 and 11. He makes all things beautiful in his time. What does that mean? It means when a thing's time has come, it is beautiful. When a thing appears at the correct time, when that child comes at nine months, it's beautiful because the child came on time. But when the child comes at six months or nine months have passed and the child is not here yet, you begin to get worried because it is not beautiful when it is not on time, something has disrupted the biological nature of this occurrence. I had a woman one time. She was 13 months pregnant. 13 months pregnant. That thing was not beautiful. It caused her doctors a lot of drama. It caused her boyfriend, <laughs> and that was one of the problems that was wrong with that uh, pregnancy. She was pregnant for somebody's husband, and the woman got to know about it and told her, I'm going to tie that child in your womb, and the child is going to take more than a year before it comes. And 13 months had gone, the child was still not here. And uh, there was a, a tent, an open-air tent service. There was a preacher that came from a country called Suriname. He had come like uh, 400 meters from where our church was. There was an empty lot there. He set up a tent. And this night he was preaching. And I told her to go to the meeting because the Lord may give you a miracle you never know. And one night, I think it was the second night of the meeting, the preacher, in the height of his preaching, he stopped. And he said, there's a woman here. You mess around with somebody's husband and you're pregnant. You are 13 months pregnant. When he said that, I had to swallow my heart. I felt like my heart was coming out of my throat. And she was paying attention. She was standing up, leading put her hand to her hip, she was groaning and moaning against one of the, one of the posts of the, of the tent. And the man said, the baby is going to come tonight. And the people were between amazement, laughter, and incredulity. It was incredible that 13 months, no way! I called one of the brothers of our church that had a car at the time, and I told him, go get the car. Get the car ready. 
uh, he knew her, but he didn't know it was 13 months. She was, I was the only one she talked to, and I didn't tell a soul. <laughs> I kept that to myself because, you know, you're the pastor. Why don't you pray and let the baby come? I had no word that I should pray and let no baby come. I didn't think I had the faith to believe God for something like that. I was just stunned. What are you, an elephant or something? And he said, your water is going to break in a minute after I pray. He lifted up his hand, and he asked the audience to join him. There were hundreds of people there, three, four, five hundred people. And he said, Father, in the name of Jesus. And I'm looking at her while he's praying. I'm looking at her, and all of a sudden, I saw the dress that she was wearing. The dress was getting moist, moist. And then water was running down her feet, running down in her shoes running down on the ground all around where she was standing. And he kept praying. And then he said, it is done. And somebody said, Pastor, uh, her water broke. I said, I can see it from here. And I told the guy who had now gotten his car from where he had parked it. And, and I signaled to a couple of people to help her along, take her in the car. The hospital was not five minutes away. They took her to the hospital. And the baby, they call the baby Tyson. Tyson was born. But when he was born, the umbilical cord was wrapped around his neck, wrapped around his head. That was why nothing was happening. She had the baby tied up. Indeed, like she said, I'm going to tie this baby up in you. And uh, what an incredible night. People were clapping and praising God when he made the altar call. People ran to the altar. They had never seen, I had never seen anything of that nature. My faith in God grew exponentially that night. My faith in the word of God in the mouth of his servants, it grew from skepticism to belief. And I've kept my belief until now. Oh, blessed be the name of the Lord. I dedicated that child. We used to call him Tyson, Iron Mike Tyson. Because he had that, that head that was bobbing back and forth like Tyson when he was fighting. But his bobbing head had nothing to do with, with boxing. It had to do with the instability of his neck in view of the umbilical cords that had wrapped him. His head was bobbing and weaving, bobbing and weaving. What a mighty God we serve. Angels bow before him. Heaven and earth adore him. What a mighty, mighty God we serve. That has been many moons ago, but I remember it like it was yesterday. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the power of the Lord. And may his power go to work on you right now. May his power go to work on you right now. May his power go to work for you, for me, for us. May he do for us what nobody else said can be done. May he provide in areas where we need his blessing. Hey, 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 hey. Somebody shout unto God with a voice of triumph. When something's time has come, it is beautiful for it to come at that time. He, God, the Almighty, makes everything beautiful in His time. But what I'm saying to you, like that woman, your blessing has been delayed. Four months past the time when it should have come. And it's not here yet. But delayed does not mean denied. I speak to decree by the power of Jesus' name that your blessing shall arrive in the name of Jesus and the enemy shall have to put a little extra for taxes for delaying your blessing in the name of Jesus. He shall add sevenfold to what was supposed to be yours. Oh, glory to God. The Lord shall cause you to suck the fat of the Gentiles and drink honey from the rock in the name of Jesus. Your season of unexpected blessing has arrived. May God pour out good measure, pressed down, shaken, running over. May men give into your bosom again, again, and again. To the glory of God, I say so, it shall be as I have said. What we want to see is that even if it seems like there is a delay, you hang on. Because God's word shall not return to him void. His word always performs that which is sent, Isaiah 55 and 11. The word is living and active. The word will work when you work the word. The word is working for us. It shall work. Oh, blessed be the name. You need to watch that message today on the word is working for me. The minister came with a word. She came to fight, man. 
She was taking no prisoners. I watched that program from Alpha to Omega. I was rocking back and forth in my chair like, yes, Lord, come on, bring me some more word. There's nothing like a word from God. I still remember that preacher. I still remember with awe that he stopped his sermon to get a download, a word of knowledge that somebody here was pregnant for 13 months. A strangest thing to announce to an audience. People thought the man had lost his mind. Some people ran over to say, Rev, this man has lost. I said, no, I know the woman. said, you know the woman? I said, yes. I wanted to point her out, but I didn't want to, you know, cause too many distractions. God is good, man. God is good. And may you bump into the goodness of God. May you see it. Sometimes we tell of these things that the Lord has done, and people look at us funny like, this guy has lost his mind. No, 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 no. May you get one. What? One what? One miracle that can put away all your skepticism. All of your agnosticism, all of your atheism, all of that. May God do it so good that your bottom lip hits the floor and somebody has to pick it up and put your jaw back in place. May God give you a jaw-dropping blessing, a jaw-dropping miracle to his glory and praise in the name of Jesus. Yes. Yes. God will always step into situations and hasten his word to perform it. According to Jeremiah 1 and 12, he will hasten his word, make his word go quick and do what he says he was going to do. I bow my head in prayer to the almighty God and I say to myself and to the audience that's watching, may God bow down his ear to me and may God deliver me speedily. Be thou my strong rock for an house of defense to save me. Our Lord God, hear me speedily. O oh Lord, my spirit faileth. Hide not your face from me, lest I be like unto them that go down in the pit. Let me not slide down into the pit. Deliver me from the evil one, for thine alone is the kingdom, the power, the glory, forever, forever. Let my light break forth as the morning. Let my help spring forth speedily. Let your righteousness go before you, and let the glory of the Lord be my rare reward. Avenge me speedily. Hide not your face from me in the day when I am in trouble. Incline your ears unto me in the day when I call. Answer me speedily. Thou power of God, hey, in the name of Jesus, move in my behalf. Move in my behalf. I dismiss and disband from my heart every thought, every image or picture of failure on matters that have caused me great drama. All of the pictures of failure that are in my head. I disband them, I dislodge them, I dislocate them from my experience. They shall not come to pass, but the blessing and favor of the Lord shall be what I will experience. Oh yes, yes. Oh yes, yes. I reject the spirit of doubt that's harassing me, the spirit of fear and discouragement that plagues me in the name of Jesus Christ. I will get what God wants me to get. I cancel all delays, and I decree for the manifestation of my miracle. I decree for the manifestation of my miracle. I say that my miracle shall manifest and it shall manifest speedily. The blessing and the favor of the Lord shall be upon the work of my hands. The Lord shall give me great victory in the midst of my enemy. He would cause my cup to run over. He would anoint my head with oil. My brimming cup will run over. Goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord. Hey, 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 hey. Mando karaba Hey man, come on now, come on now, Jesus. Let the angel of the living God roll away every stone of hindrance to the manifestation of my breakthrough. Hasten your war to perform miracles in every department of my life. Avenge me of my adversaries. Avenge me of my adversaries. Them that shoot out the lip and say, Aha, aha, she is left without help. Aha, aha, he is left without help. Aha, aha, it will never manifest. Let the power and glory of God manifest so strong. That the skeptics will tremble in their boots as they see the glory of the Lord come to pass in my life. Hey, 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 hey. My soul said, yes, I believe that I will receive. I believe that I have received. I believe and I receive it now. I take it now. I grasp it now. I hold on to it now. I get a hold of it now. Now is the accepted time. Today is my day of salvation. I have heard his voice. And I will not harden my heart as in the provocation where Israel tempted God. And their carcasses fell in the wilderness. My carcass shall not fall in the wilderness. I shall live to a ripe old age giving glory and praise to God. 
Oh yes. Oh yes. Give me a song in my dark hour of the night. Let my bald Samson grow here. And let my jawbone of an ass be the weapon of mass destruction in the battle that I'm fighting now. Give me victory, I pray. Give me victory, I say. Give me victory, I decree. Give me victory. Victory, victory. Victory to the blood of Jesus. Victory to his healing stripes. Victory to the name above all names. Victory to the power of God. Victory is mine. Mine. I'm the recipient of many victories that the Lord is giving me now. I shall shout and sing a song of praise. I will get songs in the night. In my darkest hour, my song shall spring forth. My song of praise and deliverance. Because the Lord had gone forth and has done me well. He has done me well. He has done me well. In Jesus' mighty name, amen, 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 and amen. In my last discourse with you about the protege, the learner, the disciple, the one that's being trained, I said that when the protege is in trouble, when the mentee is in trouble, they move towards the shelter of the mentor during a season of uncommon attack and during a season of warfare. Yes. The picture of David and Samuel's relationship is very remarkable. The Bible says in 1 Samuel 19:18. David fled and escaped and came to Samuel to Ramah and told him all that Saul had done unto him. And he, David, and Samuel went and dwelt in Naoth. Yes. During serious attack, David did not withdraw from Samuel. He pursued him. He invested time with Samuel. He went to Samuel in his day of trouble. Lots of people, when trouble hits them, they stop going to church. They stop requesting prayer. They don't want to see the pastor. They don't want to see the brethren. They begin to become a backsliding saint. Why? Because trouble is at their door. As if they're the only ones in the world that ever had trouble at their door while they're serving God. All through scripture, men and women who live godly, they suffer persecution. Don't think it's a strange thing that has happened to you. Christian people have prodigal sons and daughters as well. Don't be shocked. She called herself a pastor and her daughter is not living right. You saw it in the scripture. Behave yourself. Leave them alone. Keep your mouth off of people's children anyhow. Keep your mouth off of people's children. Because you will get children of your own. Then you will understand. Glory to God. That the misbehavior of the child has nothing to do with the parent's sinful lifestyle. The parents could be living godly and their children just going off, goofing off. The prodigal son came and took what was his, took it before the time. Satan always wants to give you before time what God wants to give you on the right time. Satan always wants to give you today what God is going to give you tomorrow. But when you get it today, it will disrupt your destiny. He spent all that his father labored so hard to gain. Spent it quickly and ended up in a pig pen. What a choice. He thought he could do better than his father. Parents always think that we, uh, children always think that we, their parents, are holding them back. <laughs> I'm always amazed at how they think you, oh, you, you, you want to live my life. You want to, you, you, you're holding me back. I want, want to experience life. And what they mean is they want to play the fool and get themselves in all kinds of trouble. But you, you can see it because you're old enough to know when a devil, <laughs> the woman said she, Reverend, I want you to cast out the Deborah. <laughs> she got a Deborah. Glory to God. The protege during the time of his storm will find the mentor. He will not run away. When Jesus was ready to get baptized, he went to his senior cousin, John the Baptist, and he said, suffer it to be so that we may fulfill all righteousness. When people want to start their ministry, they distance themselves from the pastor. I've had many people leave the church to start their own ministry, and then they don't talk to you because now they have become this pastor. And some leave ahead of time. And some, you start the church along with them. And they get big for their britches. And they tell you, you know, they don't want your covering. They want some other stranger that they don't even know to be their covering. What they want to do is to be independent of you. And they think you're going to hold them back. No preacher in his right mind wants to hold anybody back. Because the work of God needs as many hands as possible. Needs as many skilled hands as possible. We're not trying to hold you back. We just want you to be released at the right time. 
in the right way because we know if you jump at the wrong time, if you jump in the wrong way, you have opened the door for Satan to come and destroy your little two by four ministry that you thought was going to be the cat's meow and the dog's bow. Well, I've seen it so many times, it's not funny. When people say they want to go, is it all right? When you want to go next week, they say, no, go now. Because you know they are ahead of the time. Hmm. Samuel went with David to Neot in David's worst time. The mentor does not dismiss the mentee because they are having some trouble. That's when you stand with them. Until the storm passes by. Till the storm passes over. And the thunder sounds no more. Till the light breaks forever. From the sky, hold me fast and let me stand in the hollow of thy hand. Keep me safe, Lord, till the storm passes by. May your 13 months of delay come to an end now in the name of Jesus. My last point on that night was that the, the protege will change his schedule to invest time in the presence of the mentor. Listen to the Apostle Paul in Galatians 1, 17 and 18. He says, Neither went I up to Jerusalem to them that were apostles before me. I didn't go to see the apostles that were apostles ahead of me. But I went into Arabia, and I returned again into Damascus. Then after three years in Damascus, I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter, and to abide with him 15 days. Saul took off from Damascus to go spend time with Peter, and Peter took him into his house. For two weeks and a day and poured out into Saul all that he Peter had to pour out it is interesting that Peter was with Jesus from day one and yet it was Paul that wrote most of the New Testament the fact that you are there first does not mean you have a more significant role to play Peter's significant role was to pour into Saul and Saul was going to be the one to write most of the New Testament Sometimes the people that you pour into are going to have a, a greater reach than you. They're going to make a greater impact than you. But without your mentorship, that impact would never be made. So when they make it, it is also you making it. Because without your, uh, without your investment in them, they would not have gotten to where they've gotten to. Don't be jealous of people that you, you, you show them the way and they become greater than you. Just give God the praise. Man said his, his son in the Lord kept telling him, Papa, I can see. I'm a seer. And he could see. He was dangerous. This was a seasoned minister grooming a younger guy. And the younger guy could see. He could see people's name, their address. He could see what they were wearing, their underwear, their, their bank account, how much money they had, their bank account number. He was one of the most dangerous young men coming up in ministry. But after a while, he started to get arrogant that he was better than his mentor. And he said, but I am the seer. And the mentor said, yes, you're the seer. But I am the overseer. <laughs> That's the wisdom of God right there. The two of them looked at each other and they burst out laughing. And that was the end of him trying to pretend that he was greater than his father. Which parent doesn't want their children to be great? You don't want to raise up nothing. You want to raise up some things are you feeling a brother and when they fly you want to give them wings to fly man yeah go ahead with your bad self we need more people in the gospel you can't do it alone you will exhaust yourself and die before your time if you want to be the omnicompetent minister knowing all things and doing all things i've gone to many a funeral of preachers that i know should not have died but they wouldn't allow anybody to pray for anybody they wouldn't allow anybody to bring a word they wouldn't allow anybody to do some counseling they want to do it all by themselves because they're jealous that if somebody else does it, somehow it diminishes them. I don't know where people get off 
thinking that they can do it all. You cannot do it all. I know you're big and bad, but you cannot do it all. And if you keep doing it all, you will die before your time. So leave room for other people to come in and lift your hands up and help you along the way. Don't think that you alone can make this thing happen. Jesus said, the poor you have with you always, but me you have not always. So treat me right while I'm here. Don't be dismissive of a brother. Mm. The mentee must discern, respect, and pursue. Discern, respect, and pursue the answers that God has stored in the mentor for them. God stored wisdom in Peter for Paul. And God stored wisdom in Paul for writing the New Testament. We all have wisdom stored up in us. And we can learn. You know, a lot of people don't think that the mentor can learn anything from the mentee. But <laughs> let me tell you something. You will be pleasantly surprised to know that the people that you think you're pouring into, <laughs> they're pouring into you. They are showing you angles you haven't seen before. They are showing you ways you didn't think of before. It's a new revolution that's happening in the kingdom where the younger ones seem to have a lot more insight than the older ones. Sometimes we be so old, we become a fossil and a dinosaur. <coughs> and the young ones are fresh. Their bones are full of meat and sap. Our bones are old and dried up by now. And we need some juice. <laughs> and the younger bones have marrow and juice and fatness that we didn't know existed before. Mm. Let me say something about the satanic world. Satan despises unity. He fears the law of agreement. The law of agreement is the most powerful law in the universe. What does it say? If two, the least number, shall agree on earth as touching anything, it shall be done. Impossible things can be done by the power of agreement. Yes, and so Satan hates agreement. And when that mentor comes into agreement with the mentee, Satan shivers in his boots. He's by the phone book. He's by the, 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 the phone booth and he's dialing 911 because he knows trouble is about to break out in his house because of the unity between the mentor and the mentee. And he will invest everything to destroy the transference of wisdom. Mentorship is the transference of wisdom. Mentorship is the transference of wisdom. Mentorship is the transference of wisdom learned and earned by the mentor poured into the mentee at a snap of a finger and they get to get there quicker because of the download that they receive from the mentor mentorship is the transference of wisdom and wisdom is the principal thing but in all that getting get understanding i just said a mouthful right there mentors can be heartbroken when a worthy protege withdraws paul was hurt when demas forsook him having loved this present world the father was heartbroken at the departure of the prodigal son in matthew 23 jesus wept over jerusalem some mentoring situations will make you cry it'll break your heart to see that people that you want you know greatness is in them but they will not listen to you for nothing they wouldn't listen they think they have arrived they think they know because their suit is shinier than yours and they have more shoes than you. They think they know. Oh God, help us. Here I go. Number one, you cannot force someone to learn from you. You cannot force someone to learn from you. And sometimes the mentee thinks they know more than you. And they think there's nothing you can teach them. Some of your mentees will manifest a bigger audience, a bigger congregation than you. And some people are looking to find the greatness in others. I had a lady in the church send me a sermon. The man was talking about Jesus and he spoke about Jesus for about five minutes. And he was saying all of the things that Jesus was. 
And she was telling me that that five minutes of what that guy was talking about, and he was, he was really, he, he shook the house. He had a standing ovation when he was done. Five minutes of the most uh, sensational preaching that you'd ever heard. It, it, was, it was dynamite. I'm a preacher and I'm telling you, it was dying to the oh might. It was dynamite. And then she said it's the greatest message she ever heard. Yeah, 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 yeah. In the meantime, I had been doing a sermon, None Like Jesus, for one year. And she was a member of the congregation. So she had heard some, some fantastic preaching on the same subject of Jesus. And here she's telling me that this man's five minutes was the most fantastic thing she had ever heard. And I said, all right. Now what that guy needs to do is to add 55 more minutes to his message and then do it for one year. Because I was preaching at least for one hour. Every time on the subject none like Jesus. For one year. That's all I preach about. And she laughed. And she said, that will be hard to do. And I said, yes. And yet, his five minutes is greater than my 50 some hours he's got five minutes i've got 50 plus hours and he's he's a fantastic thing that you have ever heard what she was trying to do was to make me think that i was nothing what i was trying to do was to make her know i know who i am and five minutes can in no place replace 50 hours You've got to know your value because some of the people that God will send into your life, they will come with, with an ambition to make you look like nothing. Their gift is to rubbish the greatness of somebody. Five minutes cannot overcome one year. You cannot force someone to learn from you. Jesus himself could not force the people to accept healing. They had no respect for his ministry and he could not do many miracles among them. Sometimes their unbelief is robbing them of major blessings that is inside of you. Number two, there is always a third party that wants to destroy the unity between the mentor and the protege. And unless the protege opens their heart about it, you cannot correct it. I used to jump in and correct things that nobody called me to correct. And I found that people resented me. And one person even told me, I didn't ask you to do that for me. I can do that for myself. Don't jump into my story. Mind your own business. It was, it was a slap in the face. I said, all right, all right, man. You don't have to be so crude about it. I said, no, you, I find that you're too fast, pastor. I said, all right, let's stop now. You're getting, you're getting to that zone of disrespect now. And when my voice dropped and I challenged their sorry donkey, they backed down a little bit and then they look at me and smile. I look at them and smile. They knew that if you're going to bring it, I'm going to bring it too. You clap, I'm going to clap back. Those days I used to clap back. These days I just smile at people and I say to myself, that satanic lash that you will get will wake you up. And this attitude that you're displaying, you're going to be cured of it by a good demonic lash. Then you will understand what time it is. So these days I just wait and smile and let them get the lash. Then they come running. They say, Rev, why didn't you tell me I was going to get a lash? I said, you told me to mind my own business. So I'm doing just what you told me. I'm minding my own beeswax. <laughs> there is always a third party that wants to destroy the unity between you. There are some preachers... They seem to be unable to raise up powerful people under their ministry. So what they do is they gather your people. Because your people are well trained. They're well brought up. They're well disciplined. They're well mannered. And they can easily be, be downloaded into because they have a posture that they're ready to hear from God. And so what preachers do is they find your people, your audience, your members. And they try to pull them away under their wing and talk about the Lord wants me to, 
to raise you up as a son. Well, get your own children, you rascal. The third voice always comes along because they can't manifest duplication of themselves in people. So they want your people to pour into because they, their people are, have on their cap and they can't pour into a bottle that has a cork on. And they don't have the, the ability to get the cork off. So they look to your people to call them their sons. And <laughs> I've seen people call folks sons and daughters in Christ. And I just smile because I know what I know. There's usually a third voice that wants to destroy the unity between you and the people you're raising up for the kingdom of God. And I know about that because I've been given a mandate by God to raise up quality people for kingdom impact. Raise up quality people for kingdom impact. And sometimes people come and they see the quality of the people that you have got. And they say to you, man, how did you do it? By pouring into them. What do you mean pouring into them? I pour into my people. You don't pour into your people. You preach. That's all you do. You preach. You preach to them. You preach at them. You don't pour. You don't know what pouring is. And they look at you for a long, like, what do you mean I don't know what pouring is? You don't. If we are going to be men about it now, let me tell you what pouring is. And when you finish explaining what pouring is, you say, it's true, you know. <laughs> but I don't have the time. I say, well, I got 24 hours just like you. Many people don't see greatness in the people that God has sent their way until you see greatness in them. Then they want to take that person away from under your mentorship and put them under their shoulder, under their armpit and keep them smothered there. Smell my, my sweat. Smell my sweat. They don't see greatness in anybody because they don't have that ability to capture that person five years from now and see what they can become. They don't want that kind of five-year investment until that person blooms and bursts forth. They don't see greatness in people. They have not been taught to see greatness in people. All they see is some liability or somebody that can bring tithes and offering and make the thing look nice for them. But they have no desire to invest in the lives of people. You're going to have that third party. You're going to have to watch for that. There's always somebody coming in and want to show that they, they got the person to where they got them to. And the fact of the matter is they don't know what they're talking about. They don't know the investment that went into that person. They have no idea. Glory to God. You should not answer questions that the protege refuses to ask. You should not answer questions that the protege refuses to ask. Refuses to ask. They should ask. They know they should ask, but they're not asking. I went to a church once in this country, and when I landed at the airport, now my plane got delayed in Puerto Rico, but there was a young pilot, a young woman, she looked like 12 years old, and she had a pilot's license, she had this small plane, it looked like an egg beater, an oversized egg beater. She was the pilot, then somebody sat next to her, then there were two other people, only four people could fit in this little plane that she had, and nobody wanted to go. Because she looked like a child, like a little girl. Like, oh, How did she get this pilot's license? But she was going where I was going. My plane was delayed. I could go with her or I could stay there and be late for my appointment. I don't do late. So I said, all right, if she's a woman and she's got a pilot's license, that means she has to be twice as good as the men. You know how it is out there. So I said, I'm going to go. Because they were asking, any volunteers, the plane is going to where you're going. Any volunteer? I said, yes, I'll go. One guy asked me, why, why, why are you going? And I told him, I said, she's a woman pilot. And for her to get a pilot's license in a male-dominated whatever, whatever, she's got to be good. And he said, you know, I didn't think of that. I said, all right, let's go. And we went. When I landed there... The church that had invited me to come, they were dealing with some demon-possessed people. And one of the demons stood up in the deliverance service that they were having and said, Esibum is here. And the pastor said, the devil is a liar. He told me his plane got delayed. The demon said, Esibum is here. <laughs> Who means he's, he's landed on the island and the airport was like half an hour from where the church was. And the demon said, he will be here within the hour. 
The pastor told the brethren, no, he's, he's in Puerto Rico. He's not here. Don't worry with this demon. The devil is a liar. The blood of Jesus on you. The demon said, yes, the boom is here. Half an hour later, I got there. And they were casting out devils. I walked in and the demon said, I told you. And everybody turned and watched at the door. I was standing at the door grinning. He said, what's going on here? And they turned, they, they were shocked. Like, you mean a demon knows? We got rid of those demons pretty fast. The demon said, I'm going. I'm leaving here. They are, they are ganging up on us. You know, things to the, the words of the nature that we were ganging up on them. That the church had helped. I was the help that came to help them get more uh, more anointing. You know, more of us together, two shall agree, it shall be done. And there was a young fellow in the deliverance service. He hadn't seen Demon's Castle. That's why he was there. He just wanted to get the experience. And when the demons left, he was asking me a thousand questions. Not one question on deliverance. Everything else he wanted to know. Are you married? How many children you got? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nothing along the line of deliverance. That would be a good time to ask the pertinent questions. He was asking all of the wrong questions. And when he was finally done and it was time for him to go, they were taking me to my hotel. I said to him, what about the deliverance? You haven't asked a question on what happened here today. And his bottom lip hit the floor. Don't answer questions people don't ask when they should ask. And you know they should ask. And they know they should ask. You cannot answer questions the protege refuses to ask. Don't cast your pearls to pigs. Don't give information that people don't want. Now, I have been guilty of this for years. You know, giving information that people never ask for. And sometimes, I, you, I, uh, man, I had very little discernment then. They don't want to hear. They want to go. You're just pouring stuff into them and they don't care. Why doesn't he shut his mouth and let's get going? But now, I wrung my ears. You cannot help someone who feels that you are unqualified to bring <coughs> better men to their life. You cannot help someone who they think that you're unqualified to bring better men to their life. Some people visit other churches that are 10 times bigger than your church and they come back with an attitude. And you wish they hadn't gone to that service because now they have seen another dimension of how church growth happens and the church has 5,000 people. They come back to you with your 50 and they wonder why you don't have 5,000 and they begin to feel like Something must be defective and deficient in you. That's why that guy has 5,000 and you only have 50. And they begin to dislike you, despise you, disregard your ministry, disrespect you because they saw a guy with 5,000. And they don't know that you've got more than 5,000 under your wings. They don't know the reach. They are seeing this one-dimensional thing. They see you in this, in this, on this platform, and they assume that's all you do. And sometimes you just leave them alone and don't let them know that this is not all I do. He's got five thousand in one place. I've got more than fifteen thousand in different places. What? And you just smile and let bygones be bygones. You cannot help people who feel that you're unqualified to bring blessing and increase and knowledge into their life. Sometimes you just have to shut your mouth and go your way. Let them despise. Later on in life, they will wish that they could hear the wisdom that God had stored in you for them. But it's too late to apologize. It's too late. I haven't heard that song in a long while. Many protégés withdraw from you, withdraw from your mentorship, because they assume that their goals are superior to yours. They are a seer. They see. They, they, you know, God is using them. And they feel that they are better than you. You can't help people who feel that they are better than you. Just let them go on. They have superior goals. They have a bigger, wider vision. They have a greater 
That's how they see themselves, as greater than, than thou. And when people start to manifest that behavior, that they are greater than you, you have to back off and let their greatness flow. You know they're going to crash and burn. And the devil loves to have uh, immature people rush on and think that they are this great power of God because he knows he's going to defeat them in two weeks' time. They know it all. They've left your ministry talking about, I have greater vision than you. The devil knows. He's puffing their head up with self-importance. He knows they're going to crash and burn. Pride got before destruction. The devil was like that. He thought he could do a better job than God. I will ascend on the sides of the north. I will be like the Most High God. I will have angels come to my beck and call. Yeah, 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 yeah. And the next thing, boom, Michael knocked him clean out of heaven. Jesus said, I beheld Satan like lightning. When mentees assume that they have a greater vision than you, it is demonic at its highest. That's what happened in a perfect environment, heaven. And Satan got kicked out. Pride got before destruction. When people begin to manifest pride, they are one stage away from their lightning defeat. And you who know the principles of scripture, you just have to stand back and watch the destruction of another person who thought they were greater than you. I remember a karate movie that I watched. And there was this mentee. He was disciplined. He was focused. He wanted to be a great martial artist. But his mentor saw something in him that was a defect in his character. But he taught him all that he, the mentee, knew. And one day he got to the point where he challenged the mentor because he was younger. He had a bigger paw print and a mightier roar. He was going to take out Mufasa. And the other students, they were happy to see a fight. They knew the younger guy had some moves and they wanted to see how this fight will turn out. And uh, the mentee was younger indeed. And it showed in the fight. The mentee was quicker indeed. And it showed in the fight. The mentee had a mightier roar. And it showed in the fight. It looked like he was going to get the upper hand on the mentor. And the students were looking at the fight. They were laughing. They were bobbing. And he was looking at them, you know, to get some encouragement. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, the mentor pulled a move from his repertoire of moves. And had the young guy pinned and bawling for his life. And with two more blows. Wow, wow. He knocked him flat. Blacked him. He got knocked out. And he came to himself later on. And he said, how did you do that? And the mentor with hurt. You could see he was hurt. That he had to hurt his protege. He said, I taught you everything you know. But I didn't teach you everything that I know. I kept back some secret moves because I knew this day would come. I saw an attitude in you. And I knew one day you would challenge me and I would need these moves to whoop your little behind. <laughs> when you have a pure protege, you can tell them all your moves. When you have a tainted protege, you've got to hold back a few because you know they will challenge you and you know you're going to whoop their little behind <laughs> and teach them a lesson that they hadn't learned before. Proteges withdraw when they believe their goals are superior to yours, when they believe that they are better than you. They become discouraged by the mentor's expressed disappointment in them. There are some people that I would correct Every time I see a defect, I will correct them, correct them, correct them until whatever. And there are other people, I would not correct them at all. There are people that I will not correct. I will let the school of hard knocks do the correction. <laughs> because talking to them is like talking to a wall, a brick wall. They are not going to listen. And so you watch them in their error. And you know they're going to get 
into the school of hard knocks. Don't be discouraged when you're corrected. I spoke to the Lord one time. I was complaining. I said, you know, I see people get off with a lot of things. And if I make the slightest error, you discipline me like, like you don't know me. It's me. It's me. It's, it's your boy. It's me. It's me. <clears throat> and the Lord said, if you are without correction, you're a bastard and you're not a son. You know the scripture. I said, yes, but it's still me. He said, yes, I correct every son. I scourge and discipline. I beat black and blue, the ones that are my children, because I see ahead. If I don't correct this error now, they will make a massive display of folly in the future, and they would cause their ministry to be derailed. I've got to whip them into shape. Foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child, but the rod of correction shall drive it far from them. It's God's word, not Dr. Spock. Policiers can get discouraged when you express disappointment in some area of their life. And they quit and give up because they don't like to be corrected. When the counsel of the mentor is not adhered to, when it's rejected, God will correct them through painful experiences. Painful experiences. You either learn by being a protege or you learn by pain, but you will learn. And some people will learn by pain. I don't like to learn by pain, but some people have to learn by pain. Because they wouldn't listen to instruction. They wouldn't listen to advice. Don't you marry that fellow. They gone and married a fellow. Now they spend years in betrayal, denial, pain, hurt, and all kinds of stuff. Don't you go to that church. They're gone. Tied up themselves with a false prophet. Now their names and their face is in all kinds of pornographic acts with the, with the, with the so-called uh, uh, prophet, bishop, whatever. Stay away from that family. They're gone. Now they're in, in the lockup because they didn't listen to your advice. The law of repetition is necessary in the learning process. You'll be told one thing again, again, and again. I know you don't like to hear it, but you will be told one thing again, again, and again. I know you don't like to hear it, but you will be told one thing again, again, and again. I know it gets you upset, but you will be told one thing again, again, and again. When the mentor gets fed up telling you one thing again, and again, and again, that's when you will begin to learn. When you get fed up hearing one thing again, again, and again, that's when you begin to learn. That's when you begin to learn. That's not when you learn. That's when you begin to learn. You've got to tell them until they get fed up with you. When you have an uncommon, uh, when you have a, a learner, a disciple that has the right attitude, it is one of life's greatest blessings. The greatest success quality that is known to man is the willingness to become. The greatest success quality known to man is the willingness to become. To become what? To become you. To become the you that God designed you to be. And the mentor sees that you. And they want to chip away at the rock. Until David emerges. Can you stand the constant hammering away at your person? Chipping away at the imperfections, the impurities. Can you handle it? One of the dangers of mentorship is. One of the dangers of mentorship is. I'm going to have to do a teaching on the dangers of mentorship. But let me drop one to you. One of the dangers of mentorship is the mentor can have defects in his character, in his uh, doctrinal belief, in his grasp on scripture. The mentor may have petty things about the Bible that he holds on dearly to. 
And the mentor can download his imperfections into the mentee. You've got to watch for imperfections in the mentorship that's happening to you. You've got to know that the mentor is not an angel, that he or she can have bad ways. And you have got to learn how to avoid those bad ways becoming your bad ways. One of the dangers of mentorship is the transfer of bad behavior, bad belief, bad doctrine. You've got to know how to avoid that and still keep a respectful relationship. Because that person, imperfect as they are, they can still download information. Uh, the Apostle Peter was a racist. The Apostle Peter was a racist. The Apostle Peter, Simon Peter, was a racist. And Paul confronted Peter publicly about his racist tendencies. And Peter initially put on a fight, but eventually he gave up his, his nonsense because God showed him that vessel that came down and he said, don't call people common and unclean that I have cleansed. But you remember, it was the same Peter that Paul went to for two weeks and a day. And it was Peter that got him to the place where he could figure out that Peter was a racist. Peter poured into Paul and Paul turned around and rebuked Peter for racism. Peter's racism did not get into Paul. Paul took all the mentorship that he could from Peter and yet he was able to see Peter for who he was. And by now, Paul was not called to be an apostle anymore, Romans 1.1. 1, 1. He was Paul the apostle now. What he had been called to be, he had become. He was no longer... Moving from nurse to doctor, he was now a PhD. He was a heavyweight in the kingdom. And he could stand and confront Peter and let him know your eyes black, bro. Your eyes black. It's hard to tell your mentor that his eyes are black. But if they're black, you can't tell him any other color. Mr. Mentor, man, your eyes are black. Mentorship is one of the most beautiful ways of learning. You learn faster. You get there quicker. Your wisdom is accelerated. You know things you're not supposed to know. You have 30, 40 years of information downloaded into you in two weeks, two months, two years. You're a freak of nature because of the wisdom that you have. And it isn't earned wisdom. It's transferred wisdom, but it's wisdom nonetheless. And wisdom is the principal thing. Because of the mentor, you avoided pitfalls. You got there faster because you avoided pitfalls. They pointed out the pitfalls and told you not to go there, not to walk here. Jump that, run that, swim that. Learn to swim. Because there's a day coming when swimming will save your life. Are you feeling me now? And so, may the Lord grant us all wisdom in what we are going to do on the subject of mentorship. Elisha could part, part the rivers of Jordan because he had the mantle of Elijah. And the sons of the prophets confess the spirit of Elijah is resting mightily on Elisha. May the Lord grant you wisdom to know what to do with this information that I've just given to you. Father, <sighs> To you be glory, honor, and praise. To you be majesty, dominion. To you be wisdom, honor, and power. Let this word resonate in the hearts of mentors and mentees. Cause growth in the kingdom. Cause growth in the kingdom. Cause growth in the kingdom. Through the ministry of mentorship. Give us all the right attitude that we would not be a cosmic know-it-all and derail our destiny because when you put information in front of us that was pertinent for our destiny, we rejected it because of arrogance, because of pride, because we thought we knew it all and ain't nobody going to tell me nothing. I'm going to show them what I'm working with. 
break the spirit of pride that's ruling this generation and grant transferred growth, mentorship growth, accelerated growth. Mentorship, I say, is accelerated wisdom. The Lord bless. The Lord bless. The Lord bless. Have a good one, everybody.